Modern science has reached a frontier, and that frontier is the frontier of consciousness. Whether you approach it from the perspective of physics, uh, the question is, what, where does, or where does the observer come from? Because physics only speaks about objects, right, and their properties and characteristics and so on. Um, now we are not just objects; we are objects, but, but we are more than objects. We also have consciousness. So the question is, where does consciousness come from? In neuroscience, also the question of where does awareness uh, get um, created in the brain machine? And in computer science also, um, the question is, uh, will computers of the future be conscious? Because if consciousness is a material property, then computers should also be conscious. Maybe not now, maybe 100 years from now, maybe 1,000 years from now. So all of these subjects are reaching the frontier where the question of consciousness is fundamental. Bharatiya tradition, civilization is all about knowledge. Uh, the word Ved itself means knowledge, right? Vidya, from Ved you get Vidya. So it's all about knowledge. And there are two kinds of knowledge, the outer and the inner. So we embrace all the outer sciences. In fact, uh, if you were to look at what is Sanatan right now, Sanatan is to embrace all the Western sciences that have emerged in the last 200 years. There's no conflict. In fact, then you would say, what about evolution? Because evolution is still negated by, other, by many religious traditions. Well, evolution is a part of the Sanatan tradition. You go and uh, look up um, Mahabharata, or you look at um, Yoga Vasishta or any other text or any of the many different Puranas. You know, Kanada wrote um, the Vaisheshik uh, Sutras and uh, according to scholars, it's at least uh, 600 BCE. Now, the Vaisheshik Sutras are absolutely incredible. From his, Let's just look at uh, the scientific perspective. What the Vaisheshik Sutras say, and in fact, what the Vedas first of all say is that in all the physical universe, there are laws, and this is called Ritam or Rit, from where the word Ritu comes in, right? Uh, so there are laws. Uh, so according to Vaisheshik Sutra, because it's looking at physical reality, it says all that there is to physical reality can be determined by interplay of three things, which is Dravya, substance, Guna, which are the properties of these substances, and then karman, which is the motion of these substances, which is exactly like modern physics. What does modern physics say? There are different kinds of atoms. You know, these substances are atomic, according to um, according to Kanada. So, so the, the, you have these atomic substances, and they have different properties. You know, like electrons and protons and neutrinos, etc. And they interact. They interact with each other. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to Bharata First. And today we are privileged to have Professor Subhas Kakstar with us. And uh, I am speaking as a fanboy, so uh, I don't think any kind of intro will suffice him. But since we uh, we have a formality of introducing our guests, so I'll be introducing him. So, sir, currently is Regents Professor at Oklahoma State University, Stillwater, and he teaches computer science. And uh, sir is a Padma Shri. And Sir has done immense work in bringing the ancient science, scientific wisdom to the world. And uh, Sir has contributed a lot. So welcome, Sir, and thank you for giving us your time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be a part of your show. I've seen some of your other episodes. Fantastic work that you're doing. Thank you, Sir. Thank you. That's, that means a lot. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to start with my first question. Is My first question is that, Sir, uh, why do you think that we need to uh, propagate ancient ancient sciences or ancient wisdom, ancient traditions? And how has it influenced modern sciences? And I know that I also know, and a lot of us know that it has it has influenced modern sciences a lot, but it has not got considerable due. When we talk about maths, it, a lot of people know that Aryabhat existed or Sridhacharya's formula, like we, uh, when we talk about uh, determinant then we know that Sridhacharya was there. But when we talk about sciences such as physics, chemistry, biology, 
that nobody even knows who was Kannada and what work he did. So why do you think uh, this has happened and uh, why it is need why why there is need to propagate ancient science? Well, um, it's a very large question that you have asked of me. Uh, because uh, one could always make the case that we live in modern times, this is the scientific age, and so much has been discovered and invented in the last 200 years that let's only focus on uh, modern science. So why does one have to go back, especially uh, because uh, there is so much to learn. Every science is so huge and immense. So one could certainly ask that question. Uh, but uh, now there are two aspects to my answer. First is um, sometimes, you know, you need to have uh, confidence in yourself, not sometimes, always, before you can move forward. If you are always looking for approval from somebody else, that means that you're not using um, reasoning on your own. You're not unafraid. In science, you have to be fearless, right? You have to challenge orthodoxy. So. One aspect is psychological, that you need to be certain that indeed, contrary to what uh, textbooks or history books uh, in India tell you, India had a very robust and powerful scientific tradition. And in fact, according to uh, the Spanish Islamic uh, uh, historian, who in 1065 or 1068, his name was Said um, Al-Andalusi, he compared the sciences of all the nations as he understood them a thousand years ago and he concluded that the world's number one nation is india as far as sciences is concerned i think that continues until about 1700 or so because even the scientific revolution uh, which is uh, credited to the the, the discoveries uh, about calculus etc that were made by uh, Newton and Leibniz had already, those discoveries had already been uh, made in India 200 years earlier in Kerala, in what is called the Kerala School of Mathematics. That is, calculus had been invented or infinite series had been invented. But now this is a psychological uh, side that we need to be um, more, um, more realistic as well as uh, correct in our understanding of what uh, India's past was so that we would then stand up and um, use logic to the extent it can be used without being afraid of approval, whether somebody else is going to approve it or not. But now the other side, which I think is a, a more important side, is that uh, modern science has reached a frontier and that frontier is the frontier of consciousness. Whether you approach it from the perspective of physics, uh, the question is, what, where does, or where does the observer come from? Because physics only speaks about objects, right? And their properties and characteristics and so on. Um, now we are not just objects, we are objects, but, but we are more than objects. We also have consciousness. So the question is, where does consciousness come from? In neuroscience, also the question of where does awareness uh, get um, created in the brain machine and in computer science also. Um, the question is, uh, will computers of the future be conscious? Because if consciousness is a material property, then computers should also be conscious. Maybe not now, maybe 100 years from now, maybe a thousand years from now. So all of these subjects are reaching the frontier where the question of consciousness is fundamental. Now. Consciousness is the very heart of the Vedic sciences, of the Vedas. Um, in um, Munda Kopanishad, for example, uh, it's stated that there are two kinds of Vidyas, Apara and Para. Apara Vidyas are the Vidyas related to um, objects or concepts and their relationships, which is all the sciences that you learn uh, in college, right? You learn chemistry, physics, that's all apara, as well as uh, linguistics or sociology. They're all apara, even though sociology and linguistics don't deal with things, but they deal with conceptual categories that you can analyze. Now, the other category uh, that the Munda Kupanishad speaks about is paravidya. And paravidya is the science of consciousness. That's the very heart of all of the Vedas is paravidya. 
because in the Vedic tradition, everybody is told that learn as much of Apara as you can, right? Because that's what you need in order to sharpen your mind, um, uh, logic, uh, analysis. And, uh, but ultimately, in order to uh, arrive at a new way of understanding uh, what reality is and who you are, you need to go to Para. And para, is, para can be only obtained by going within, going within into oneself. So, so this para, which is consciousness, is now the frontier of science. You know, you go to the West, any field, everybody is talking about consciousness and they're trying to say, well, we need to create a science of consciousness. They just don't know how to do it. Now, all of that is uh, a, a something which has been discussed and analyzed and on which the most extraordinary uh, insights are already a part of the Vedic tradition or the Indian, the Sanatan tradition. So th that's the other reason that we need to go back and connect to it. So I was wanting to know uh, that whenever I read about the history of science, I see a very big contrast between two different approaches. For instance, uh, when we look at the development of science in Europe or Middle East, there has always been a conflict between religion and science. In fact, the principal opposition to the development of scientific ideas has come from religious institutions and orthodoxy. While in the case of Bharat, if you see, uh, people who we call today as astronomers, physicists, mathematicians, they were indeed very religious to the extent that we may even call them orthodox in today's time. So how is that? Bharat as a civilization could nurture talent and genius in such a way that sci the scientific and the religious mind could peacefully coexist in the same individual. Well, uh, Bharatiya tradition, civilization is all about knowledge. Uh, the word Ved itself means knowledge, right? Vidya, from Ved you get Vidya. So it's all about knowledge. And there are two kinds of knowledge, the outer and the inner. So we embrace all the outer sciences. In fact, uh, if you were to look at what is Sanatan right now, Sanatan is to embrace all the Western sciences that have emerged in the last 200 years. There's no conflict. In fact, then you would say, what about evolution? Because evolution is still negated by, other, by many religious traditions. Well, evolution is a part of the Sanatan tradition. You go and uh, look up um, Mahabharata, or you look at um, Yoga Vasishta or any other text or any of the many different Puranas. What do they talk about? They say that, well, uh, the whole universe was created in the beginning. There was Srishti and then the various Bhutas arose. You know, the, you have the bunch of Mahabhutas and then there was more interactions and slowly the universe evolved. And then, uh, in, in fact, there is a very interesting passage where it's stated that initially on earth, there were no humans. They were huge beings uh, and the actual word that is used is that they were asuras. They were great asuras and they controlled, they, they existed all over the earth. And then these asuras all died. Asuras, you know, it's very interesting, it's a coincidence, like the dinos asura, you know, <laughs> dinosaurs and so on. But that's just a coincidence, just for amusement. And then humans arose. This is the passage, right? Now, uh, so there is no conflict at all. This is the way of knowledge. It's not religion. The word religion itself means, I think it's a Latin word, which means what binds together in society. So it's like, religion is like a punt, right? A, an organization of people uh, with certain dogma. Now, Hinduism is not about dogma. It's about learning, about a journey where each individual can get connected to um, the knowledge of oneself and by knowing oneself you know Arist uh, not aristotle i think socrates said know thyself right so by knowing yourself you'll also then find it easier to know the outside world so this is the universal way of knowledge that is what sanatan dharma is and it's open to everybody now, because it's such a revolutionary and beautiful way, extraordinary way of knowledge, first of all, there are two aspects to it. 
uh, from a sociological part of it that almost all the wise people that i know of and i know some of the top people in the west they uh, they are very attracted to it they say yeah this makes sense you know like that uh, a famous article in newsweek uh, uh, where this writer lisa miller said we are all hindus now in terms of beliefs but uh, uh, so this is one side to it the other side is that uh, that uh, they it's not just that the tradition has talked about uh, consciousness uh, because it's you know to talk is easy uh, what are the other subtle insights that emerge out of it see for example uh, in western thought also um, there have been uh, the question of how does you know how does the soul interact with the body because soul is not the body and uh, this is of course in a religious sense but more interestingly uh, in recent years the question has been asked how does consciousness if it consciousness is not material which is what the vedas say they always say it's not material it's something transcendent that's why it's para if it was material there will be apara right if it's upper if it's para how does it interact with um, apara with the material world right and this is a problem in quantum mechanics also you know i do quantum mechanics and i am aware of all of these uh, various uh, questions and debates and uh, an answer was uh, uh, developed by my late friend the, the great uh, indian vedantin physicist george sudarshan who was from kerala as you know and in the 1970s he and his student wrote a paper called the quantum zeno effect where he argued that uh, uh, you know now in in uh, traditional physics you're not necessarily using the word consciousness uh, because consciousness is difficult you know what do you mean by consciousness you can always say so in traditional physics you say observer observer and the experiment if the observer is not a part of the experiment then can the observer influence the physical system so george sudarshan and a student came up with a uh, argument which is called the quantum zeno effect they said just by observation alone repeated observation the evolution of the quantum state can be frozen and then later on and i myself also worked on it later on it was shown that by observing in a particular way you can actually evolve the state of the physical system right without expending any energy just by observation right and uh, and and so this is one way um, of uh, the two coming together the observer and the physical system now this is something which is part of the vedic tradition thousands of years earlier there is a theory which later on was called srishti uh, drishti srishtivad the question that was asked in uh, vedantin circles was how does um, shiva for example if shiva is consciousness you know shivoham shiva is the word for consciousness that is used in the tradition that every human being or every sentient being is shiva right if shiva is consciousness how can shiva control reality now of course you don't have to call uh, consciousness shiva you may prefer to call him krishna or vishnu or the goddess whatever you know these are they are all the same they are different looking at consciousness from different lenses right so how does it do it so the whole answer then was that through drishti srishti is done it's not that god as in certain other traditions god is viewed as in anthropomorphic terms as somewhat like a human being you know with a body etc who has hell and heaven and he puts certain people in hell there are fires and then he probably smashes on people's heads with his hammer and so on there's no such thing at all uh, transcendent is consciousness right it, it it's all over and just by drishti alone srishti is done in fact uh, you know in esoteric or deep traditions such as in various tantras tantric traditions you have uh and i don't know if you have seen shri vidya have you seen the shri vidya structure right you have all these triangles which is a representation of the inner cosmos as well as the outer cosmos and in the very middle is tripura sundari right the goddess tripura sundari you know these are various 
divinities which are different ways of approaching the heart of reality to which you can become a part of of which you can become a part of so right in the middle is also a bindu that is shiva so in other words it's sort of infinitesimal the more you look for shiva the more it recedes because shiva projects itself through prakriti shiva is prakash uh, in kashmir shaivite tradition kashmir uh, shiva is prakash and prakriti is vimarsh so you can only see what there is in the vimarsh in prakriti so ultimately to come back to focus on the science aspect of it what all this is saying is that uh consciousness has projections on physical reality or on the brain if you are looking at it from the perspective of neuroscience and you can look at those projections as as those shadows so to speak and to and, and thereby you can um then find the deeper understanding your understanding can go from the ordinary loka loka is the way of looking as you know the word loka and look have the same etymological root so there are different lokas the ordinary loka is you know as a child you are walking around and you know going and playing etc that's the loka of ordinary experience but as you go deeper in in your understanding of the inner then you see the sense that is outside in the unfolding of the universe then you are in higher locus you see that and and therefore you know that's what you need to do in order to do science or any creative work any creative work requires going away going outside of the box that you were in and then suddenly seeing things in a manner which was not apparent earlier now in the previous question um uh, the the name kanada came up you know kanada wrote um, you know, the vaisheshik uh, sutras and uh, according to scholars it's at least uh, 600 bce now the vaisheshik sutras are absolutely incredible from a, let's just look at uh, the scientific perspective what the vaisheshik sutras say and in fact what the vedas first of all say is that in all the physical universe there are laws and this is called ritam or rit from where the word ritu comes in right Uh, so there are laws uh, so according to vaisheshik sutra because it's looking at physical reality it says all that there is to physical reality can be determined by interplay of three things which is dravya substance guna which are the properties of these substances and then karma which is the motion of these substances which is exactly like modern physics what does modern physics say there are different kinds of atoms you know these substances are atomic according to um according to kanada so so the, the you have these atomic substances and they have different properties you know like electrons and protons and neutrinos etc and they interact they interact with each other they have this motion and looking at all of that you can determine the properties of the physical universe but now kanada goes beyond modern physics and it says and it which also includes certain aspects of modern physics he says uh so this is a triangle right the triangle of the physical universe then he says there's another triangle which is the triangle of the observer the triangle of the physical universe is shakti the triangle of the observer is shiva so in this triangle you know this is that old shiva shakti yantra uh, that we have in this triangle of the observer there are three sides one side is samanya which is universal there are some manya properties related to the universe the second corner is vishesha in fact the name vaisheshika comes from vishesha and what that means is based on where the observer is in relation to the physical system there could be specific unique properties that emerge which is what you know relativity for example found that right special theory of relativity was to show that depending upon what your motions are in relation to each other uh properties become uh, different objects shrink or expand time shrinks or expands right and the third corner at the top is samavaya which is where 
the physical, the observer and the observed interact. Now, what's interesting from a history of science point of view, because part of your question was about that, Indians don't know any of this, sadly, even in the physics departments. I don't know of any guy in the Indian physics departments who has studied uh, Kanada's Vaisheshik Sutras at all. There, there are some studies which were done by philosophers 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago, right? In the English language, because after all, we, India has uh, colonized itself or willingly chosen colonization of the mind because nobody reads original text. So for you and me and everybody else, we have to see in when you're in school or college, is there a book that you can read Vaisheshik Sutras in? There is no book. In fact, the first book which translated it was, I did it six years ago. I wrote a book called Matter and Mind. And it's so amazingly modern, it's extraordinary. And it's such a tragic situation that we don't know about it, right? Now, what one needs to do is to go back and look at this. Uh, and also talking of the question of influence, Vaisheshik Sutras have already influenced modern science. How? Um, uh, the story is that in 19, uh, nine, uh, sorry, 1898 or 1896, I forget the year, Vivekananda was traveling to India, uh, to, to the US. He was in New York City. And Sarah Bernhardt was the great famous um, French actress. She was the most famous actress of her times. She, along with a troupe, uh, uh, was visiting US and she was in New York. She threw a party and she invited uh, Vivekananda because he was very famous, you know, this young uh, yogi from India, young wise man. And she also invited Nikola Tesla, the famous engineer. You know, now, of course, people know Tesla much more than uh, in earlier decades because of the Tesla car, right? So, uh, so they got together and uh, Vivekananda wrote about it in, uh, in a letter to his disciples. So we had those letters uh, because these two people met. He wanted, Sarah Bernhardt wanted these two people to meet. And um, um, Nikola Tesla wrote about it in his diary. So in that, Vivekananda, and he was quoting or mirroring um, um, Vaisheshika and Vedanta. So he says, look, according to um, Vedic science or Vedic physics, it should be possible to convert matter into energy. At that time, uh, Tesla was interested in uh, transmitting energy um, wirelessly. So this was one of the issues that he was looking at. In fact, he kept on working on it until his very last day and he wasn't successful. But uh, Vivekananda said, look, according to our physics, it should be possible to convert a matter into energy. So why don't you work on it? And if you do it, not only would you have solved your problem, but then uh, Vedic science would be much better known to the rest of the world. And uh, now there is one, and of course we know that he didn't do it. It was Einstein in 1905. And before Einstein in 1903, uh, there was another guy, an architect who wrote an 80 page long paper saying that E equal to MC squared, but he has been totally uh, forgotten uh, because he, sort of didn't use mathematical, you know, he uses kind of hand-waving arguments, but uh, uh, but although it was done, and it was probably also implied in the work of um, 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 well, Poincaré and others, you know, in, in sciences, it, of discoveries are made, a lot of people are working on the same kind of stuff. And so many, there are many people who have uh, almost arrived at the same intuitions. So now Kanada in Vaisheshik Sutra also says, of course, that there are four fundamental particles. Uh, of course, the, the words that he uses for them, uh, which can be misunderstood are Prithvi, Apaha, um, Tejas and Vayu. They're not to be seen as earth, uh, water, uh, light and Vayu, because what he, what in the Vaisheshik tradition is also stated that every object has all these four. These are, and they're atomic, they're Anu, so they're atomic, every object. And the argument is this, that look, you take a piece of gold, right? It is a solid. So Prith, the word Prithvi means solidity, okay, it's solid. Now you heat it, 
it becomes it melts so it has it already had the apa uh, atom in it which has now manifested itself right then you heat it further it starts burning and it emits light which means tejas atoms were already in it and now they have gotten manifested right and then if you heat it further it loses its mass which means vayu takes it away and now there is a very interesting coincidence perhaps you might say that there are four stable particles in modern physics and what are these four stable particles one is um, the proton right which is what gives mass to all of physical reality is mostly proton uh, proton and neutron is uh, proton plus electron right the second is electron which has very little mass but electron is what allows atoms because atoms are bound together through electrons in their shells so that's what makes it possible for them to slide across each other which is what gives rise to fluidity right and then photons is what uh, light is and electromagnetism is is photons right and then finally neutrinos is what uh, operates in the weak force which causes decay now look these are four stable particles now you might say that well it's a coincidence it is a coincidence i totally admit but the whole idea of the vedic tradition which people in india just don't get it because their minds are colonized is that every human being has the same purush within them right the same consciousness within them and consciousness is a part of reality and therefore by by looking into consciousness itself and how do you look into consciousness because you can't be we, we are up examining reality through in all our analysis wherever you're using nyaya that is logic right is through the mind and mind is not consciousness mind is vimarsha mind is reflection on physical reality of consciousness right but doing it in a very subtle way this is a kind of a subtle dance you can understand and you can reach those locus of understanding of intuition right because you can't talk about it but you can reach that locus which is what opens up the the uh, the inner chakshu if you will the inner eyes open up right and that's how you at this you don't have to be a physicist or a neuroscientist anybody in whatever you're doing whether you are a businessman you can have insight about what's going what's happening and therefore then you become a revolutionary in your field or as an artist or as a dancer or or as a leader of people because a true leader of of people is who understands other people in a vital way right and not only understands other people also understands the flow of events so that's what uh, all this does so in other words to come back to your question there is no separation between anything uh, the vedas are the overarching path of knowledge and they are for everybody right because every human being uh, depending upon their level of development are at some loka you could be at a beastly loka like a animal kind of loka and then you see things in animal terms and therefore you are cruel because animals can also be cruel now you might ask why should if everybody has shiva within them everybody has infinite potential knowledge within them how come that some people don't get it some people don't get it is because two aspects to it one aspect is of course uh, um uh, the 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 temperament that you are born with right there are kids which are different in the same family they can be different but more importantly the sanskaras that you receive uh they can allow make it easier for that light to penetrate through the uh, various layers that envelop your mind you see your mind is an instrument antahakaran right it, so the light can stop going in if the light stops going in then you can really be like a pashu 
right? Because a Pashu is somebody who is bound, meaning through Pashas, to, uh, to, to nature, right? So a, 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 a tiger's nature is to kill, right? Uh, so, they, so that is the Pashu nature. And a Pashu is easily led by stories, right? You can give a story to any human being and then they will follow it. They'll actually believe it. You know, most people believe literally anything. All You go back to any civilization or culture, there are all kinds of stories. There's bizarre stories, uh, strange stories, which are sometimes part of a, 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 a tradition, a community, because people just want to live and they want to be led, right? So they take these stories literally, but uh, in order to be free, which is what moksha is, and moksha is in this life. Moksha, you know, India went through a lot of hard times. Then you sort of said, no, this life is so terrible. You will get moksha only when you're dead. Moksha is in this life. When you break that kar karmic chain, karmic chain, when you are karmic chain, we, each human being is mostly like a pashu through instincts, through expectations and stimuli and responses but when you are able to break that karmic chain then suddenly you're free and then suddenly you at that moment is when you become shiva and that's when you have uh, an opportunity to move forward become a leader and you know what's incredible is and this is where this the horrible colonization of india uh, especially after 1947 what it has done to people in this whole tradition is a tradition of total freedom and equality. Every human being is equal in this tradition, right? But what students are told in schools and colleges is that the Vedas are all about hierarchy. They're not about hierarchy at all. Every human has the same Purush within them. It doesn't matter what your social background is. It doesn't matter where you're from, right? Whether you are male or female everybody is equal everybody is equal and so what the books tell us is just the opposite of what the truth is and the great uh, sages even of modern times have recognized it you look at aurobindo you look at um, you know the the sri lankan english scholar ananda kumaraswamy or gopinath kaviraj north south east west or ramana maharshi and people used to uh, ask him what do we do in order to advance he would say uh, swadhyay you know study yourself because within every human being is the same atman right that's what krishna tells arjuna everybody and that atman he also says it's also called purush right so the same purush is within each individual so sadly what has happened uh, I talked about Pashas. India has gotten entangled or been bound up by false theories, which the British came up with. And there were some great uh, British open sages as well. But, you know, there are two aspects to control. There were also those who were looking more at controlling India, you know, who thought that they were superior. India as a place which needed to be civilized. But there were others who realized that India was the place of wisdom, extraordinary wisdom, totally unparalleled, nowhere else. So, uh, but, you know, I sort of digress. India has had a great uh, scientific tradition, um, not just in uh, the physical sciences, certainly in mathematics, we know it, especially in the last 20, 30 years, all the work uh, in the Kerala School of Mathematics uh, has emerged, you know, Nilakantha, Madhava, et cetera, et cetera, the infinite series that they came up with so that it's not Newton, but 200 years or 300 years prior to that, but also uh, machine theory, you know, uh, computers are based on machine theory or mathematical logic. Mathematical logic um, arose in India a thousand years before 1850. 1850s is when it, it came up in England, uh, the names of Charles Babbage and Augustus de Morgan and George Boole are associated with it. But uh, according to George Boole's own wife, Mary Boole, and she wrote the famous essay on it, 
she says that these three were disciples, so to speak, you know, intellectual disciples. Men, they were mentored by George Everest, who was India's surveyor general, and he used to live for many, many years in India. And I think um, his grave is probably still in Missouri. His house is certainly in Missouri, I know. So uh, Mary Bull writes that uh, George Everest brought Indian logic, which is called Navya Nyaya, which is equivalent to mathematical logic. So mathematical logic, as we know it, was a rediscovery or reformulation. Mary Boole was trying to suggest that he talked about it and they only redid it, right? And it arose where? In Bihar and Bengal. Um, Gangesh and many other names are associated with it. So this is 1000 years prior to this time. But sadly, uh, Indian students are not aware of it because we don't have, first of all, a course on history of Indian science, right? And secondly, all this has not been incorporated, even as stories. You know, if you had a story on Indian history and a section on, you know, 1000 years ago, what was going on in India? Uh, and as a story, people then realize that, well, we should be more confident of ourselves. Now, talking about 1000 years ago, um, some of you may have uh, seen my recent medium essay called uh, Bhoj Paramar, uh, History's Greatest Scholar King. Okay, this is, he ruled um, most of Central India and parts of South India from 1000 to 1055, which is a long, long uh, period, you know, some say 1010 to 1055. So at least uh, 45 years to 55 years. So long time. He was a great conqueror. Um, he went, he expanded his kingdom in all directions. And even the Ghaznavids, Ghaznavids who were attacking Afghanistan, etc. He even sent his armies to help Afghanistan. You know, there was Anandapal and Trilochampal, right? And then he was a great builder. He built this enormous, massive temple called Bhojeshwar uh, in Bhojpur. And in that, he was probably trying to uh, emulate, uh, you know, his ally was Rajendra Chola, the great, great king who also conquered Southeast Asia. So the two of them ruled most of India, right? His Rajendra Chola's father in 1010 built the greatest building, uh, which is the Brihad Ishwara temple in Tanjavur, 1010. It was the greatest building in the world for about 750 years until the 19th century. So now, can you believe it? Indian school books don't even talk. They, I, I believe I've been told that Bhoj, Raja Bhoj is given two lines and Rajendra Chola is probably given a paragraph. This is the golden age. And not only these two intellectually, look at Navinyai arising at the same time. Raja Bhoj also wrote 84 books. There is no king in the history of the world who was his equal uh, in, uh, in intellectual prowess. He wrote books on all kinds of subjects, on astronomy, on grammar, on Ayurveda, on music, on Dharma Shastras. Uh, he was also a poet. Okay. So now, what do Indian books tell you? Indian books tell you, you know, it's such a shame. They tell you in, knowledge was controlled by the Brahmanas, right? The Brahmans controlled it. It's stupid. Raja Bhoj was not a Brahman. He was a king. He, he, was a, he was a great, you know, he was a Rajput, right? So what's wrong with Indian? Indians have become totally alienated from, uh, from true understanding of India's history. And not only that, what uh, what uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which is the greatest book of yoga, if you will, and yoga is everywhere in every corner of the world right now. People want to be connected to yoga, either Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or the Bhagavad Gita. What does uh, uh, Krishna say? That uh, the same Purush is within each person. And from according the Purusha Sutra, uh, Sukta says uh, of the Rig Veda that uh, from the Purush, from the Purush arise the four classes, the four Varnas. 
each human being has the same purush within. So each human being, if you do Shastrartha, Shastrartha means you have the Shastras, you try to find the implications of it. What it means is that every human being has all the four Purushas within them. Every human being. So this whole conflation of Purush and Jati was done by the English in their 1901 census. So every human being is also a Brahmana, is also a Kshatriya, is also a Vaishya, is also a Shudra. That is the true Shastrartha of this understanding. And we have been separated from it. That's why we don't understand our sciences. Why don't we understand our sciences? Because after 1947, uh, uh, the powers that be, because they didn't know their own tradition, they said, well, all of the Sanskrit knowledge, uh, Sanskritic knowledge is religion. So this will not be a part of the curriculum. But Sanskrit knowledge is Shastras. Shastra, the word Shastra means science. Most of it is sciences. There's also Bhakti. And you can say that bhakti is something to be done privately. Fine, don't be, don't have that a part of the school curriculum, right? Because that, okay, for that you have to be connected to your guru or your own tradition and so on, right? Your parampara. But the shastras are universal. The uh, shastras are sciences. Vaisheshik Sutra doesn't talk about one. Um, Devata, one Devata or the other, deity or the other. It's all about what physical reality is. You threw out Vaisheshi, you threw out um, um, uh, Mimansa, which is analysis. You threw out uh, Sankhya, which is, you know, analysis of various fundamental categories of reality. So the reason why Indians don't know it, because we in 1947 chose not to know anything about our own tradition the greatest scientific tradition that has ever existed, in my view, and open even now, which is why it is so vital. People don't read Freud anymore. They still read yogas, yoga sutras, right? Because yoga sutra or yoga, the yoga tradition, the yoga framework is of vital, vital energy. You know, it's vital, it has vitality. It is still open. It, and connects you to something which Freud and Jung missed because yoga also has Purush within it. And Purush is that Atman. You know, the whole idea, if you look at it from the perspective of Indian tradition of consciousness, you have five koshas, pancha koshas, right? The pancha kosha theory. You have the physical body, Annamaya kosha. Then you have the Pranamaya kosha, which are the various forces going through your body. And then you have the Manomaya kosha, that's the mind. Now, uh, Western tradition, until recently, until 100 years ago, um, only was concerned with the bodies, you know, Annamaya Kosha. And so they went out and destroyed bodies, you know, they went out to the new world and they massacred people, the Incas, the Mayans, the original people, or likewise people came to India because they were only looking at bodies. They're blind otherwise, mo mostly bodies. Then Pranas, but then because they there was no inner turning but of course there was mind certainly there was also mind and this mind was filled with certain stories of domination which is the asuric aspect of reality but what uh, the veda says more subtle than the manomaya kosha is the vijnana maya kosha uh, which is of course where science comes from which is why india was the leading nation of science and even more subtle than the jnana is ananda, ananda maikosha. And what ananda maikosha gives you is a sense of sense, is a sense of re relationship with physical reality, how we are all connected together. Now look at uh, modern America. <clears throat> America is the richest nation that you can ever imagine in history of mankind. So there's everything, there's no dearth of anything. But look, in 2021, 92,000 Americans kill themselves unwittingly through their addiction, through drug overdoses. Why are they getting into drugs and other addictions? Because that Ananda is missing in American life because it's based only on the body. Of course, their body, they are doing some yoga, but they're only doing the asanas, which gives you some pranamaya kosha, you know, some sense of pranamaya kosha. Manomaya kosha, where do they learn that? They go to school and college. 
So they know all those theories. So that's the mind, the, the loka of the mind, right? Then Vijnana Maikosha, not everybody, because most people don't know science. They don't know about this, the deeper connections, which is what science gives you or theories give you, right? That's the Vijnana Maikosha. Ananda Maikosha is that <clears throat> vital connection with reality and with everybody else. You know, when you get that wisdom, you realize that you and everybody else are the same. Every, that samabhava, that equality. As long as you are stuck in the Manomaya Kosha, you are Asuric because it's all about domination, right? And that's what the English thought. The English thought that Indian society was hierarchical. It's not hierarchical. It's hierarchical in social function at some point, right? Because if there is a function in any civilization and there's a function, somebody has specialized role, right? And so in uh, Purusha Sukta, it was visualized that society itself is like, like a body. You have the head, you have the arms, you have the thighs, you have the feet, but the Adhara, the base is the feet, right? The Adhar is service, seva. In fact, if somebody comes to me and says, I want to learn from you, how do I learn? I tell them that you don't learn by reading books. You have to let go. You have to do seva, service. Everything comes from bottom up. That's why uh, Krishna or Vishnu as the pathway to knowledge resides in the feet. Now, the English didn't understand that. They said, you know, Shudra means something at the bottom. Uh, the Vadyas, the thinkers, they just got it differently. But in any event, the actual sense is that every human being has all the four uh, uh, varanas within him. Within, varanas are colors. Which colors color your thinking? But now, finally, above Ananda Maikosh is uh, the Atman because it's the Atman which energizes everything else. Without the Atman, you don't have uh, that Vimarsh that takes place, right? Without the Shiva, Shakti is incomplete. So this is a system which puts everything together. And what we need to do now is to be connected to it with, not in a sense of believing everything uh, or accepting everything literally, because the whole idea is that you don't accept it literally, but use it for uh, vimarsh at your own end, right? Because that's what education is all about. And I think that's what needs to be done. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. It was uh, really enriching. I mean, uh, in, in half an hour, you covered a lot and uh, it, it can generate, uh, I guess, uh, interest to anyone who is not either connected to science or not connected to science. I mean, uh, when you we used to study science, uh, we used to see it as kind of, you know, solving maths and solving equations. We never delve deeper into why why we are doing what we are doing. But uh, I think if we know our ancient traditions well, then we'll be, I mean, uh, knowing more about sciences, which we currently do not know. And like you told about uh, the the kings, I think there are a lot of kings sir, who have not got their due. Like uh, since you are from Kashmir, uh, Lalita Ditya from Kashmir or in that sense, uh, we can say Vanraj Chhabra from Gujarat. There are a lot of kings who have not got their due in history. Sir, uh, so uh, not digressing much, I'll proceed with my third question. My third question is that, uh, sir, when we talk about Judeo Abrahamic tradition, they have this concept of others. I mean, uh, they, they, ha they are supremacist. But when we talk about our tradition, it has always been universal. And we have always, uh, it is also, now also it is universal, but when we are now propagating our ancient traditions to these judeo abrahamic communities, how do we propagate it in a way that it doesn't lose its originality? Well, um, as you said, it's universal. If it's universal, it's for every human being. And uh, we want every human being to be able to realize their potential, right? Every human being, you're born. And if uh, people also go through a lot of mental pain, why do people go through mental pain when they're growing, when they're adults? It's because they're not realizing their potential. They realize that there's something missing. So what, what, what we want is that everybody should be able to realize their potential. So I think what we need to do is <clears throat> present 
this tradition the way it's actually supposed to be not the way it's written up in books what it's supposed to actually be you know you have the six darshanas out of these five are about analysis you know uh, the mimansa the two mimansas uttar and purva mimansa or or sankhya and vaisheshika and uh, nyaya these five are about analysis but what is lived uh, sanatan uh, tradition lived is yoga yoga is where it all comes together right and i think something beautiful is already happening around the world uh, which is this yoga tradition uh, yoga revolution across the world every corner of the world no matter where you go you'll see that people are doing yoga even in their homes i'm sure a nation which is based on hate for india hate for hindus namely the nation of pakistan even there i'm quite sure in their rooms women and men are doing yoga yoga yogic asanas and certainly in iran and in saudi arabia etc because everybody wants to know knowledge now of course I mean, a lot of these people are doing it for physical fitness which is fine we are also physical bodies we are physical bodies we have to uh, acknowledge it but the asanas now i must also say asanas uh, themselves sit on top of yama and niyamas yama and niyamas are ethical preparation you know what the sanatan tradition also focuses on is morality and ethical tradition also implies equality and respect for everybody else and swadhyaya and so on so in these yogic uh, studios across the world now people are aware that you have to do ethical preparation uh, you have to be moral you have to be disciplined you know you shouldn't have avarice you know and all of that stuff but once you have done that the more asanas you do your mind opens up to pranayam opens up to the higher lokas and this yoga i think will be will take this sanatan knowledge to every corner of the world uh and um sometimes of course people say and that is the political side of it uh even uh, indian leaders say that yoga is not hinduism etc you know hinduism yoga is the heart of hinduism it's the heart of sanatan dharma yoga is you know what's the great book of hinduism which people use to be used to take uh, oath on you know if you are a parliamentarian in new zealand or in hindu parliamentarian in australia or certainly in india you often take the oath on the bhagavad gita bhagavad gita is the very heart the main book of yoga right what hinduism is yoga and that's wonderful you know i think all this division has been created by people who've written about hindus it's yoga it's open to everybody what the bhagavad gita says the great book of yoga what it says is that depending upon your temperament you would want to do yoga which is and what is yoga yoga is union of purush and prakriti of atman and the body of mind and self right because mind itself is a part of the body so how do you do it you can either do it through deeds through actions which is karma yoga you can also do it through uh, art could be called laya yoga you can do it through chanting because chanting uh, leads you to a different aesthetic experience so you could call it mantra yoga or you could do it through devotion so then it's bhakti yoga or you could do it through meditation then it's dhyana yoga or you could do it through opening the inner uh, eyes then it's uh, it's uh, jnana yoga right it's jnana yoga so you can do it in different ways and each path is perfectly fine it's not that one is superior to the other somebody who does bhakti yoga is that path is as great as any other yoga and uh, this is something that's missed and in fact you know i i truly believe in it. given all the assaults on the sanatan tradition for many centuries by people who didn't understand it if they understood it they wouldn't have assaulted it because it's the most beautiful thing you can imagine 
but given it how was it kept alive it was kept alive i truly believe in it by our mothers and grandmothers because they may not have known sanskrit and many of them did not some of them did but they hold the way they were brought up the sanskars that they went through right you look at their mother or grandmother in bihar or bengal or up or wherever any part of the con- any corner of the world they kept the deepest meaning alive and they were able to communicate it and even after the last 75 years where all this wrong stuff has been told to kids in school you know they're told they're told hinduism is about exploitation it's about oppression patriarchy which is what all the english media keeps on drum hammering it away in spite of that why it is it's all totally false all of those things are false you know the same purush within each individual everybody the same all the varnas within each individual why it is remained alive is because of uh, our mothers and grandmothers and that's where that's why it's coming back up because they ask they you know they say well but this is not right this is like you know that child who said that the emperor had no clothes everybody you know these you know the story the 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 swindlers they want to cheat this emperor they they pretending to build to to weave this cloth but they are doing nothing right and they say that all those people who are stupid cannot see the cloth so people are afraid to stand up and say well but there is no cloth and then they call the emperor the emperor is also scared that if he says that there is no cloth they would say that you are stupid that you shouldn't be emperor so he pretends then they pretend to put the ropes on then he goes in a procession right and then everybody is afraid everybody knows that he's naked but they're afraid to say that he's naked because nobody wants to confess that they're stupid then there's a child who screams hey the emperor has no clothes and then everybody else says oh yeah the emperor has no clothes that's what's happened to india the indian education the curricula is like that emperor what people have been told is false these are false theories that were constructed by the british not that they were doing it aware that it was false you know you can also get into uh, modes of thinking which lead you to wrong understanding so because they were approaching it approaching india through the sense of power what they saw they were projecting their own attitudes on india you know so they saw in it what they wanted to see in it and that's why they got it wrong it's not that they were stupid or they were deliberately trying to do it but they were projecting their views on india which is the reason you know why when um, people who have done uh, these modern courses in indian universities these young people they go for their um, uh, field work to villages um the village mothers and grandmothers see through the shallowness of their understanding you know they just they nod but they know that these people are you know they still bachche hain samajhte nahi hain and i think that's really what the truth is and now is the time for that samavai of the true understanding to converge with modernity also because you know now we are not just living with nature as was the case for centuries and centuries now we also have technology we have technology cannot be wished away and technology is also a useful thing and ai we're getting the ai age machines will do more and more work in every aspect of society in india as well right and as uh, is expected india will be the world's largest economy in the next 20 30 years um, it's already at the number 3 level um in purchasing power parity uh, it's china us and india and india is supposed to overtake the other two in the next 20 years it will be larger than china and us as well so now is the time that all this extraordinary wisdom and its universal wisdom it's for everybody we want a way so that this loka this way of looking at reality through the ananda maya kosha which is being not provided so to speak or a pathway to that is not being provided by modern society because modern society is stuck 
at Annamai, Pranamai to a certain extent, Manomai certainly, and Vijnanamai to only the intellectuals, right, who do theory. But most people are not interested in that. They just want to live lives. And when you want to live life, you want to have access to all these koshas. You want to be a good human being. You want to be a human being who is beautifully connected to your environment, to your family, and to the community. So you need Anandamai Kosha also. And then you need to be energized by, by the Purush, by the Atman. And this knowledge will or must, it's universal, it's not sectarian. There's no patriarchy, there's no hierarchy. It's the same Purush within man and woman, right? Uh, um, and it's light, it's Prakasha. So that Prakash should go to all corners of the world and it will because everybody wants to everybody wants light you know when it's dark at night everybody craves it you know in place in countries which are up in the north near the north pole people get depressed in the winter months because they don't see the sun for a long time or the days are very short and that cheer uh, comes up like shakespeare's sonnet shall i compare thee to a summer's day because you know in england the days were short so summer days were long. So that beauty of the sun, uh, Sanatan Dharma, Sanatan tradition is like that sun. It's light, it's free, it's open to every human being. And it's our responsibility because we have received it from our mothers and grandmothers who were really the guardians of it. It's our responsibility to give it to every other human being in a sense of equality. Thank you. So very beautifully explained. Uh, so moving forward, uh, I would like to continue with the point you just made about the education system in India. And it, it is uh, well known that uh, throughout the world, this culture of yoga and the spiritual tradition now is being followed in many parts of the world. But sir, if you see today the history of the land, which has given so much knowledge and wisdom to the entire world is written in such a way that and you, you also mentioned it in your, uh, your previous uh, answers that the youngsters usually uh, look, uh, look at it through the lens of caste and superstition even now. So, so what's the way forward? How because these knowledge traditions have been like very cleverly wiped out from our textbooks, and it seems very intentional in some uh, sometimes when you look at it. So, how should we? Uh, why? How is it, how important it is to reform this education system so that people value and get to know about the richness of our culture and realize that it is science and logic and not superstitions which are and always have been the foundations of the civilization. That is a big challenge and I think what you are doing is providing an answer to it. Uh, till such time that uh, the, the curriculum is changed and that is political and why is it political? You know, the British who control India firstly through power, physical force. And now they, con the Europeans uh, uh, control it indirectly through the curriculum. You know, uh, what, what's happened is that the left is allied uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the people who are connected to uh, the tradition of colonialism, right? So for them, this tradition is a kind of a challenge because it challenges uh, the Western perspective reality, because the Western perspective of reality, also there is a ontological reason also, fundamental reason, which is that the Western view of reality has place only for bodies and mind, of course, mind emerges and emotion. It has no place for the Atman. So it's a revolutionary challenging thing. And there is amongst some intellectuals, and people do realize that there is opposition to that. And the, uh, the political class in India, uh, which controls the narratives, uh, or which has controlled the narrative for 50, 60, 70 years, is allied to <clears throat> thoughts in the West, which if one were to use um, uh, the, the, the uh, terminology of science, is stuck in Newtonian science, in Newtonian physics, in body physics, right? Materialism. So it's stuck in that. But science has moved on. 
quantum mechanics, which is the basis of all of modern sciences, was created by an Austrian who was a Vedantin. And this Austrian, Erwin Schrodinger himself admitted that the central idea of quantum mechanics came to him from Vedanta. Okay. So what has happened in India is that India, Indian intellectual life is controlled by the successors of British colonialism who believe somehow because British colonialism was based on racism. It was based on the idea that the British were superior to Indians, right? So now uh, the idea uh, that who, who run this and many of them write for English newspapers in India is that somehow the Europeans and Americans are superior to Indians. So if what they are doing something, then we must also be doing this. And if their popular narratives don't have any place for Indian wisdom, Indian popular narratives should also not have any place for Indian wisdom. If they don't know about Indian festivals, which were a way, dramatic way of bringing all this knowledge to the child, to the person who's growing up. You know, all of Indian festivals were a way of way of meditation, so to speak. You know, you come together and uh, that connects, connects you to the subtle ideas of what the Atman is, right? That you have this whole inner cosmos. And this is done in a variety of ways, through nritya, through dance, through drama, through the through itihas, right? Through Puranas, you Mahabha. What the argument could be made that this um, uh, renaissance in India started when people got reconnected. People didn't know it. They got reconnected to it through Ramayana and Mahabharata. Before that, until the 1970s, it was probably a complete darkness. You know, Indians were told that this is all horrible. It's only superstition. I think there is a walking back now, and it should accelerate. Now, even if the books are books uh, denigrate um, this uh, tradition, most readers don't pay attention to it. Some do. They, some very good students do. They think that this is the truth. And then they go to college, etc. And then they come to hate India. And there's a lot of self-hate also. One should not um, do, one should not discount it. But that self-hate is a consequence of lack of knowledge. These people who are trying their best to know what the world is, they've been told that this is what India is, right? And so they say, well, what can I do? So I should hate it. But your media, medium and other media, which are making it possible for the true story to come out are a corrective and things will change because everybody ultimately would want to know that if this is indeed what it is, how come Canada has this? Or how come even now this idea of consciousness, right? Because there is a huge crisis. If you've read my stuff on consciousness and physics and all that, there's a huge crisis in physics itself. They have to invoke 96% of the dark matter and dark energy, which doesn't exist, for which there is no evidence at all. So consciousness is the way forward. That's where the Vedic tradition will be or is already becoming center stage. Okay, sir. On this note, uh, we'd like to thank you, sir, for giving your valuable time. As always, it was enriching to listen and learn from you. And I hope that our viewers really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Enjoy being part of it.